and then two, TWO. I believe it's a national disgrace, and I believe it will definitely get worse unless we finally reach a point where we're going to try to do something about it. Three, T-H-I-R. I don't know. I'd say T-H-E-R. You take the table. Any place special? Sure, what do you think? Where my name is, down the street there. That scene was from a film I made a couple of years ago. It was about an adult illiterate, and we called it The Pride of Jesse Hallam. Tonight, we'll meet people who have lived through the pain of illiteracy and who will give us an insight into their lives. Dennis Boschers, a railroad worker, has tried three times in his life to develop the simple skills of reading and writing. John Hare, a sanitation man who nearly died in a car crash because he couldn't read a road sign, Arthur Nicholson, an artist condemned to a class for slow children at school because they thought he wasn't bright enough to read. We'll discover why in this nation today there are 26 million functional illiterates. That's a fancy way to describe adults who are so illiterate that they can't read the label on this aspirin bottle. And finally, we'll see what's being done. The government, private industry, and a dedicated core of volunteer workers are battling with illiteracy in a fight against what has been called our most solvable social problem. Everyone, universities, experts, the government, everyone has agreed on one simple point, that the number of adult illiterates is enormous. But there's disagreement on the precise numbers, partly because so many adult illiterates are so ashamed and embarrassed, they don't reveal their condition. The most conservative estimate puts the number of functional illiterates at 20% of the adult population. That means that one in five adults is unable to read and write. They can't read road signs, restaurant menus. They can't fill out job application forms. They can't read Medicaid forms. In other words, they find it nearly impossible to survive in our society. According to a University of Texas study in 1975, there were 23 million adults who were functionally illiterate. What's more, a further 40 million had real problems reading and writing. Based on this survey, the government reckons that today, eight years later, with an increased population, the numbers are even bigger. 26 million functional illiterates plus 46 million who can only function at a marginal level. That's a total of 72 million Americans. For the functionally illiterate, nothing that's written means anything. It's all gibberish. Ordinary things like street signs, shop signs, advertising slogans, newspapers, restaurant menus, children's books, household bills. It's a little bit like being in a foreign country. You understand nothing. You feel cut off, isolated. They develop the cunning of a fox, finding ways to get by. What's Dennis Bosher slip his menu to his wife, who orders for him? <coughs> What's Bill West coolly ask directions? Or Jack reveal how he writes checks? For 10, 12 years, I got a number system on my check book, 
uh, from one to a hundred. It's spelled out after the numbers, see? And then when I go to write a check out, I know about the amount there, and I look through here till I come to the amount. So I put it on top, and then I can pull it out and write the check without anybody realizing what I'm doing. But therefore, I'm able to write out a check, see? Wasn't for that, uh, if I went to the grocers with that checkbook, I couldn't write it, the amount out. So I've carried these around for approximately 10 to 12 years. They can't read any kind of direction if they can't read. They can't read how to make a pattern of clothing or how to cook a recipe or how to follow directions on a medicine, how to get from one place to another on a map, uh, how to look up a name in a telephone directory. They just can't function in our society. They can't learn anything new unless somebody tells it to them if they can't read themselves. And then if they can't write, they can't pass along anything that they want to. They can't even leave a message for a child or for a, a relative that they've gone out for a few moments if they can't write. I made signs for my wife and she helped me to understand them. And uh, just symbols, more like caveman style. Like a draw of a picture of a house or uh, a telephone that she knows to call me or something like that. Bill West, the steel worker from Pittsburgh, is a deacon in his local church. Uh, if I wanted to do something at church or anything like this, I'd sit down and write it out and get the figures so I would know what I'm talking about when I'm up in front of the congregation. Will your wife understand that? Um, I'll have to help her with it, yes. She'll, but she'll understand most of it completely, really. Call the church to order. Open the meeting. Ask for nominations three times. And what's this? Just pass, uh, pass, pass. I'll pass the ballots. ballots. Collect the ballots. Ballots. Close the meeting. Thank you. I, I don't think you'll have any problem with it, Bill. My wife understands this, you know, to the point that we can make communications when she's not around. When she's around, of course, I just tell her where I'm going. I don't think this country realizes that it has this serious problem. It is far more serious than most of us in this country know or believe to be true. Some of my very good friends who know the work I do, they know the students, they still cannot believe, refuse to believe, that there are 40 million plus adult illiterates in this country. Arthur Nicholson was not retarded, but he was put in a class for slow children because he could not read. Now he works in a canning factory in New London, Connecticut in a job where he doesn't have to know how to read. I don't have to know how to read through that job, but um, if I was in the back room putting labels on the cans, I'll have to know how to read. But I'm not doing that job. Um, there's no reading involved yet, but I, I guess the long I'll be there, it probably will be reading involved if um, I have to go for a license to be a canner, a, a full-time canner. <laughs> Not knowing how to read, you be to yourself most of the time, and um, you learn to get hobbies, to do things. I would build model cars and paint. I would jog. Most of the things, dexterity, do with my hands and stuff like that. If it came to reading, I would just put it aside because it would just, it would just bore me or it, it frustrated me. It was just hard not knowing how to read because you couldn't do too many things. You didn't know what was happening. It was a game. You couldn't read the paper. Couldn't read the TV guide and know what was on the TV for that week and stuff like that. I made a mistake and uh, and I, when I was going to the bathroom one time, it said it said, it said men and women, it said gentlemen and ladies, and I couldn't I couldn't make out the difference. So I went to the ladies' room. And I, I I seen that it was the ladies' room and left. <laughs> I'm a painter and I love to paint, and that's how I have my free time. Any free time I have, I try to paint and create something. I learned how to paint by um reading comic books and stuff like that when I was young. I couldn't read them, but I liked looking at the pictures. I get my ideas sometimes from a heavy metal magazine or science fiction books like that, and just by watching movies. I've had a showing of my artwork up in Hartford, and I'm going to have another show in April at a, at a Connecticut college for, about, for a month, and hopefully that'll lead to other showings.
Uh, these are the individuals who are unemployed. They are those whose uh, lives are, uh, are greatly uh, diminished insofar as their own fulfillment and productivity and self-image is concerned. And then that matters for the rest of us uh, because uh, we are required to, uh, uh, to uh, support these individuals uh, when they can't support themselves. Economically, they're a drag on our economy rather than a support to our economy. In testimony to Congress, the Secretary has gone even further and estimated three-fourths of the 10 million unemployed lack the simple skills they would need to be trained for the jobs that will open up in the next few years. For a start, if you can't write, it's difficult even to fill out a job application form. Well, that uh, creates a bit of a problem, especially when you've got to fill it out on a job site. Now, if you can pick it up, and then you get someone in your home or so forth to help you with it. It ain't all that big of a problem. I'd usually fill mine out at, at home or in the car, if I possibly can. And uh, usually you can. You can find a way. Jack, that's not his real name, works in a nuclear power plant. Uh, heating and air conditioning and nuclear power plant. Uh, that's where their applications are a little bit tougher than anywhere else. Now, they pick me because of the job that I do on the job. I do know my job. I was general foreman for a company for nine years, so evidently I'd done my job, you know. But in that nine years, that company didn't know that I couldn't read and write. If they knew I couldn't read and write, I wouldn't have never got the breaks that I did. The reason Jack wished to remain anonymous in this film is that he was frightened for his job, and he's right. Illiteracy can mean lost job. It can also have tragic consequences. People poisoned because they can't read simple warnings, or injured because they can't read a danger sign. It can even make the difference between life and death. On the 15th of October, 1979, John Hare was driving down this road in Tennessee and nearly killed himself. I was coming down this road here, and I did read that sign. Well, when I come to that uh, dead end, I tried to stop, and it was just too late. I hit them gravels, and it just wouldn't stop. But along about here, the car is not, not skidded this way. And the front end, the front end of the car took a nosedive and hit that bank out there and flipped over top of the fence. I don't know why it turned two flips or what, but it landed on the top. I was unable to read the sign. You know, fast enough, or quick enough to know I didn't, just didn't have the education, though, just to flash to tell what it was without having to spell it out. It pinned me in, uh, I stayed pinned in about three and a half hours. Took up three and a half hours to me out. But still a bone in my face. They had to rebuild my face by my photograph, my picture. Busted every bone in it. The economic costs of illiteracy are enormous. It costs money. The government pays, the military pays, the taxpayer pays, and even the illiterate pay in unrealized earnings. The total is unthinkable, and the bill is now due. One of the things I hear when I go around the country is, well, I can't volunteer. I'm too busy. I've Barbara Bush, the wife of George Bush, the Vice President of the United States, has long campaigned to help illiterates. Today, she's presenting the annual awards at PLAN, Push Literacy Action Now, in Washington, D.C. She's keenly aware of the cost to our society. Illiterates breed illiterates, sad to say. And that's why we've got to break the, the trend. We've got to teach adults to read. First of all, it's just economically good sense. We get back $3 for every dollar we put into it. Uh, the cost to... The government, therefore, the American people, is tremendous. We spend a lot of money on welfare, as you know. We spend $6.6 .6 billion a year, I think it is, keeping 700,000 illiterates in jail. And inside the prisons, the inmates themselves see a direct connection between illiteracy and crime. Most of the crimes for which men are sent to prison 
are based on economics and by people not being able to hold a steady job because of lack of skills, reading skills particularly, um, they resolve to crime. If a man can read or write and he can't fill out an application, he can't find a job, no one's going to hire him. You know, what else do you have to turn to? That's crime. The Ford Foundation in New York City funded the research by Carmen St. John Hunter, who wrote the definitive book on the subject of adult illiteracy. Some of the consequences are not ones that have strictly to do with how well people read. They have to do with the fact that there's a large portion of the population that is unable to to reason, to think for themselves, to independently get information and act on it. And therefore, they become a kind of permanent underclass, if you will, who are, who are used, who are taken advantage of because they can only get very low-paying, low-skilled jobs. A lot of people are, are somehow lost. People who might contribute with ideas, and new ways of looking at things in our society. Harvard researchers say nearly all of our kids will learn to read if they get support for literacy someplace, either at home or in school. And those are the two places, the home and the school, where you've got to look if you're wondering how 26 million people became illiterate. I think that our parents, our homes, and our schools have failed to educate these people, most of whom are capable of learning and being literate and being self-reliant. Uh, reason I mention the family and the home and the school, I should also add the community, is that I think that you can't just blame the schools. Uh, it's, it's more than that. The uh, student needs to come to school with a readiness to learn and with, a, with a, a willingness to try. And that hasn't happened in, in many of these cases because of the, the unfortunate lives and the homes and the family circumstances in which most of these people have grown up. Well, with me now and hold my hand the family circumstances the secretary speaks of exist in communities all over the country. A classic example can be found on sugarcane plantations in Louisiana. I want Jesus to hold my hand, walk with me, Lord, oh, walk with me. Here for generation after generation, the people have lived and died in the midst of the sugarcane fields with virtually no education. These families are locked into a cycle of illiteracy. Their parents couldn't read, couldn't read school report cards, for example. The children were needed to help support the family, left school as soon as possible, and ended up not reading. They too got trapped in the cycle of illiteracy. Oh, walk with me. If you would ask any of these parents, would you rather be living here on this plantation or farm, they would say, no, I would rather be living in the city paying for my own home. But they have no choice. This is where they are trapped here, you understand? So they were trapped here because of several reasons. First of all, perhaps when they were coming up, their parents were living in the same house, perhaps. And when they were in fifth, sixth, or seventh grade, the parents say, maybe you don't need any more schooling. Maybe you've had enough education. Or uh, maybe the child said, mom, I don't want to go to school anymore. And there wasn't very much encouragement for him to stay in. Joe Moton lives in the shadow of the sugarcane mill. His parents didn't read, but he's determined to break the cycle of illiteracy in his family. He's 
short there some use it is uh, right right example following must have a word when you have had just some things I couldn't do and I just figured by learning to read I understand the, the read things that I see then a lot of things flash on television I can read so I understand what's going on the end with a Come pong. I will make you into a boy. This is how I'll do it. Go home. Go. The cycle of illiteracy in Franklin, Louisiana, knows no racial or religious barrier. Nellie Louvier lives just down the road a mile or two from Joe Moulton. Most times, you find her out on the bayou fishing for a living with her husband, Arthur. Hello, Joe. Hello, Nellie. Twice a week, regular as clockwork, Nellie gets together with her tutor, Bill Chambers, to learn to read. There were no schools where she grew up, and no one taught her at home. Her kids. Kids. Back to Anne. Very good. I want you to read all of these words with your eyes first. First word, Tim. A child's background is not the only key influence on his ability to read. His schooling is vital. Many illiterates missed out on this most important stage of their development. They told me when I was in the ninth grade, they couldn't teach me no more. I passed to the tenth, but they told me that the principal said, uh, you might as well get out and go to a trade school or learn uh, what you can. Get you a trade, you know, anything to help yourself because you're not learning nothing in school. They just passed me through. And I did pretty good in art and all the other, 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 all the other courses. And I had a um, good comprehension of um, things was happening around me. And I guess they liked me and they didn't want to keep me back. <laughs> I just didn't get into school like I should have. You know, uh, my dad died when I was a uh, five year old and my mother had a lot of kids and it's, it, it's hard to uh, raise them for yourself. I always got uh, D's and F's, never cared, never bothered. Nobody took time to, you know, to take patience with me, to show me, to direct me in the right way. So I was out of school most of the time that I was in school, and they passed me because of my age, not because I was smart. And there were a lot of disappointments and a lot of hurts. In April last year, the Department of Education released a major report on education. It declared, the educational foundations of our society are presently being eroded by a rising tide of mediocrity. The fact of the matter is, American education system if you look at the gap between what is and what it ought to be, you'd say you'd have to conclude that we are uh, uh, we are at a very low point right now. A year ago, Anthony Alvarado was district supervisor in East Harlem, New York, the toughest district in the largest public school system in the country. On April 28th last year, Anthony Alvarado was appointed chancellor of the New York City Board of Education. He is now faced with all the problems that could possibly beset any school in the country. For example, New York now has a 45% dropout rate. I think that education mirrors society. And the tide of mediocrity is a societal tide of mediocrity. If you buy technology uh, for personal use, it is not manufactured in America. If you buy transportation, it is not manufactured in America. If you buy steel, it is very often not manufactured in America. There is clearly, in my view, over the last 10 to 15 years, there has been, across all aspects of human endeavor in this nation, a clear lowering of expectations that manifests itself in poor performance 
and lower quality. And I think that the schools mirror that situation. The former Benjamin Franklin High School in East Harlem, New York, is a case in point. Basically, what happened here is, over the last 10 years, it became a very, very much of a failing high school, a typical urban type of decay in terms of high schools. The attendance rate in the school itself probably ran around 45 to 50 percent, and that was when you took attendance around lunchtime, so that very few students here were here very seriously. I think they graduated somewhere around 7 percent of the entering class. In other words, 7 percent of the children who walked in the door as freshmen or as sophomores graduated from the school. 7 percent, yeah. It's a, it's a little, uh, the numbers can be frightening. As I say, when, a, when an urban school decays, the decay can be incredible. Okay, take a look at these questions, and then we'll go. The questions raised by the Nation at Risk report have generated a flood of proposals for reforming the country's schools, including higher academic standards, a longer school day, merit pay for teachers, and so on. Although different communities will apply different solutions to their school, it's a measure of the seriousness of the problem that in New York City, they have gone so far as to shut down some high schools. Benjamin Franklin High School was shut down and reopened with a new name, the Manhattan Center for Science and Mathematics. A new program was designed with new staff and a new structure, including elementary grades. Little Red Riding Hood went on picking flowers until she could carry no more. And then she remembered her grandmother. She continued on her way. Ten years ago, we were the bottom of the city's testing pool. We were the 32nd out of 32 districts in reading, which was about as low as you could get. In the last 10 years, we've gone from 32nd to 15th. I think the symbol that is used very often with Benjamin Franklin and the Manhattan Center is the cover of the, uh, uh, of the student handbook. The cover of the Benjamin Franklin handbook was a pair of cross sneakers superimposed upon a book. The symbol of the handbook of the Manhattan Center for Science and Mathematics was a series of computer uh, screens that related to expectation. The expectation of the former was unrelated to the purpose and the mission of the school. The symbol of the latter really held a superior expectation on the part of students. The crisis in our schools is so extreme that every year more than a million kids drop out. What's more, 11% of those who do graduate are functionally illiterate. Arthur Nicholson was one of them. Well, graduating from high school and not knowing how to read is kind of a, a, a funny feeling and everybody's shocked when they find out that you graduated from school and you can't read. So I don't, I don't really feel bad about it. I just feel like I cheated. According to a new plan, it's not there, but you would believe it's there because it's there. Ed Donahue is now the head of construction at Brunswick Hospital on Long Island, New York. He also graduated high school unable to read and write. But his family, like other families around the country, felt so angry, they decided to sue their local school district. I felt that something had to be done about it. When I got out of school, I brought it to uh, a lawsuit to see if something could be done about it. He has a high school diploma, but he couldn't read it. We wanted to bring this to the attention of the public. We wanted other children to get a fair break, because my son went through high school, and we didn't know what was wrong with him through junior high, through grammar school. Ed's lawsuit failed, but it did generate enormous publicity. We get a lot of letters from all over the country, all over the world, rather. Uh, supporting our idea and thanking us because it made them look into their children's problems long before we got ours solved. We've let schools deteriorate to the point that it is possible to get through in some instances without learning how to read and write. 
We have let our community accept the fact that significant portions of that adult population cannot read and write, but will not do anything about it. Those two deteriorations are the biggest single cause. Many illiterates are ashamed and embarrassed at not being able to read and write. It's difficult for them to swallow the pride and come out and learn, and they have to face that same embarrassment again. But for those who do, there are powerful and compelling reasons and rewards for learning to read and write. John Hare, his boss has told him that he could get promoted to management with better skill. Arthur Nicholson wants to help his daughter learn to read. Bill West can now read signs and maps. He doesn't have to ask directions anymore. And Beatrice Rada, who's very religious and often volunteers her time down at the local hospital, wants to be able to read the Bible better. There are places for all these people to learn to read. There are government programs, computer programs, community volunteer programs, prison programs, and programs run by private industry. In 1982, General Motors closed their assembly plant in Fremont, California. On March 5th, the last car rolled off the line. GM joined together with the state of California and the United Auto Workers Union to offer a retraining program for the 7,200 workers laid off. But of those who applied, almost 40% lacked sufficient literacy skills to take advantage of the program. So an additional remedial education course had to be established. We have a population where 75% of the individuals have uh, graduated from high school. And they've scored uh, below the seventh uh, grade level approximately 38%. And consequently, it's very difficult for a person um, who doesn't have the basic skills to do well in a vocational training program. So we've had to establish remedial education programs to bring up their levels. Loretta Stewart worked at GM for 10 years. As one of the 38% of workers who needed remedial education, Loretta took us to the Displaced Workers Center where she could apply for the retraining program. I need to have you fill out this application, the top portion, and just the bottom half. Mm -hmm. And you have a seat right there, and the counselor will be with right with you. Okay. Well, in going over the application that you filled out before, I noticed that you were interested in computers yes. or something in the electronic field. Yes. We do have a couple of orders that are open. There's one in electronic tester, uh, a microwave tech. All of these take higher grades than you received in your bulk test scores. We have uh, a brush-up skills class going, and it's at the Fremont Adult School over on Cavalera Street. It's a five-week course. They'd be, there'd be brush-up classes in reading, math, vocabulary, writing, and spelling. Who would like to start it? Okay, Loretta, thank you. I thought I was very secure in my job. I had over 10 years at GM. And it's very frightening to realize that you're, you no longer have a job anymore. I had to go out and look all over again for a job. And the jobs now are hard to find. And, and, and it's not with GM, just everywhere. And GM has a program going now with the UAW where we've been retrained. I feel maybe if I do go to school, maybe I can be retrained you know, for another job. People are surprised to hear that one of the chief reasons many adult illiterates want to learn to read is so they can read the Bible. In Franklin, Louisiana, there's a church program like hundreds around the country helping people learn to read. The reading program has been running for eight years now, and Hannah Smith was one of the first to enroll.
In his sermon, the Reverend Edward Jordan hammers home the importance of reading. Now, we are so grateful to know that there are many people that didn't get a chance to go to school. There are some that dropped out of school. Amen. And I, I've heard many people say, well, you know, Jesus didn't bother about all of that. But we're reading a scripture tonight where Jesus entered the synagogue and he picked up a book and he read. He was able to read. But the Lord, I'm talking about a doctor that has never lost a picture. Do I have a witness tonight? He has never lost a picture. But I'll stop by to tell you that the Lord is all right tonight. He'll make a way for you. He'll bring you. title. Let's read the title. Fish. Okay, the fish. Hannah Smith is now 67 years old. She's found that learning to read has helped her with the ordinary, everyday things in her life. The boy here, fish. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Okay, and now what? Let's read this one to find out what, G or what the boy does with the fish. Okay, the, the boy gives the fish to Jesus. Okay. But the special reason why Hannah is learning to read is so she can read the Bible to her blind husband. After school, the second time Dennis Boschers tried learning to read was when he joined the Marines. It was 1968, the height of the Vietnam War. At boot camp, his sergeant discovered Dennis was illiterate and ordered him to learn to read. I said, I can't read. He said, you tell me you can't read? I said, yes, sir. He said, I don't believe it. So he gave me a pretty rough time and actually tried to screw me and started choking me and beating my head up against a tin building. It sounded worse than what it was. But he was trying to scare me, so he told me that they was going to put the smartest guy to teach me to read. And within uh, six weeks, or well, the first night or two, I learned a few more words and got a little bit better. After about the third night, I told one I didn't believe there's no chance. I, I don't believe I could learn it. I said, they'll just have to beat me to death. I don't believe I can learn it. While Dennis learned to fight in the Marines, he never learned to read. He joined the Cotton Belt Railroad when he was discharged, getting his father to help him with his job application. And he's finally found a way to become literate. Please pass the meat, said Ron, uh, Ray. I have not eaten any meat from four, three days. Dennis is learning to read in one of the 636 Lawbach programs scattered across the country. Community-based and staffed by 25,000 volunteers nationwide, these programs form the backbone of the work done to help people with no literacy skills at all. Place. Please. Please. Mm -hmm. Please. Yes, you're right. Pull, pull. Pull. Play that. The pull, pull. pull. Now, you remember that consonant blend Rita Brashears, Dennis's tutor, is all of 75 years old. She's devoted to her students and dedicated to teaching. I'm kind of funny. I just think that everybody sort of um, owes some rent for their space on this earth. I don't know why I feel that way, but I just do. I guess it's my upbringing. I was an only child, and uh, only children ha kind of have a lonely life, but they think a lot and they read a lot. I didn't always do this. I was just telling somebody the other day when I was first married, we got in the car and played bridge all the time and ran up and down Main Street and stopped and got our Cokes, went back to playing bridge. But I have found so many more things that I'd rather do, and this is one of them. Welcome, everybody. We're here to learn to teach adults to read, and I'm glad each of you could come. We are here because there's a problem in Jefferson County. We have 11,000 people here who can't read and write, 11,000 adult, adults. These signs on the wall here, you probably won't be surprised at, that there are 23 million United States adults who cannot read. But the, the most shocking one of all is Jefferson County, 11,000. That's one in four cannot read. But you're the three out of the four who can, and you're here to help, and I'm glad you're here. Barbara Dixon runs the Lawbach Volunteer Program in Jefferson County, Arkansas. 
The Laubach method was especially designed to teach adults to read, but Barbara is desperately trying to train enough tutors to cope with a waiting list of people wanting to learn to read. He's going to walk in, his heart be pounding, and he needs assurance. And so I'm going to give you the key on how to work with him, and that is to learn a pattern, a way of talking to him to make him feel comfortable. There's 44,000 adults in Jefferson County. 11,000 are considered functionally illiterate, which means they cannot function in our society today. We, in, in this last year, have trained 177 tutors who've each taken the 12-hour workshop and, and become a tutor. But we have a problem in that we have an attrition rate. We lose tutors. So we're actually, at this point, we're only tutoring about 73 students. But that's 73 more than last year. Now, how are we going to reach this 11,000? You know, at, we're just working at the tip of the iceberg. Now, we're going to do the second line, and I want you tutors to be the tutor, and Linda will be the student, all right? This, this is the cup on its side. Say the cup. Cup. This looks like a cup on its side. Say the cup. Cup. This, this is, is the word cup. Read cup. Cup. Cup begins with the sound. Say the Again. 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 Okay. Cup begins with the sound. And the name of this letter is C. Say C. C. Again. C. Again. C. Again. C. Okay. This is a picture of a knife next to a dish. Behind the bars in the Camp Hill prison near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, it's the literate inmates who teach the untrained prisoners. The Laubach Literacy Program here at Camp Hill Prison has been highly successful. With the help of Peter Waite, director of Laubach, they're planning a conference to help other prisons set up the same program. Part of that conference would include public uh, people that are involved with literacy, such as, uh, well, we hear a lot about uh, Vice President's wife, uh, Mrs. Bush, and her efforts to help literacy uh, develop in the country. We want other people to get in and see what we're doing. That is our first With over two society. million people being added to the pool of functional illiterates every year, Laubach Literacy, the Literacy Volunteers of America, and the other smaller volunteer groups just can't cope with the scale of the problem. We have a situation where we're just barely staying even in terms of keeping up with those students who are coming forth. We are not making progress. Yeah, my name what is... What are we applying for here? Social Security. Okay. My name is Beatrice Reva. To combat illiteracy, the federal government is spending $73 million a year, mostly on adult basic education programs in communities and colleges across the country. One of the largest is the ABE program in La Puente, California. Right at this moment, Bee's he's doing some work that is partly reading and partly writing. And she's reached the point in the work that she's been doing where she's learning to fill out a job application. The Read Achiever, Unit 7, Lesson 6. The selection you are about to read contains several unfamiliar words. Listen to these words and see if you know them. The government program in La Puente is varied and flexible. We teach when people want to learn. So our classes are open from 8 in the morning to 10 o'clock at night year round. And uh, we register new students any day of the year. When they walk in and they say, I'm ready to go to school, we'll take them and immediately set up the schedule for them at their convenience. B already reads well enough to handle her job as cafeteria cashier, but she wants to improve so she can read the Bible better. In God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. In Baltimore, Maryland, the city has joined forces with private industries to fight illiteracy. Together with Control Data Corporation, they've established a computerized learning center to help students on a third grade reading level improve their literacy skills. It's computerized. It comes with a basic skill lessons. The students just type in their names, they type in their groups, uh, their password, and they just go in. It's more like instead of using a book, they use a computer. 
This fascinating, really, because up to school I didn't even get a chance to touch the computer yet. This is my first time ever working with it. Two hours a day, five days a week for 12 weeks, students get a chance to improve their English, their math, or even prepare for the high school equivalency exam. It's a lot of fun, you know, because a lot of things that I don't understand, my children understand. This way, I'm being taught a little more and a little more faster than they are, but at least I feel like I can keep up with my children now. There are 115 learning centers across the country. Here in Baltimore, the program is so successful, there's a four-week waiting list. Yeah, I think it's fun. I'd like to work on it. I think it's better than having a teacher. This is my teacher right here. All these programs, the computer programs, the volunteer programs, the government-sponsored adult basic ed programs are superb in themselves, but they reach only between 2 and 4 percent of functional illiterates. Gil Schiffman, formerly director of the National Right to Read program, thinks we won't make progress until all of these different programs are coordinated. We know how to teach most students, children or adults, to read. We've known it five years ago, we've known it 10 years ago, I think we've known it 20 years ago. The problem is that we don't know what to do. The problem, I feel, is very often our delivery system. How do you get this knowledge down to the classroom, to the teacher and the child, to the tutor and the 2T? As long as we have different funded programs working at, at odd ends, as long as we have different people guarding their own frontiers, not working together, we'll never make it. I asked Secretary Bell to explore with you the best ways and means to erase adult illiteracy from our country, and the result is this initiative that we announced today. Some of the key points in the initiative are to provide initial federal funding for the Coalition for Literacy and support the National Ad Council in its awareness campaign. To establish a national adult literacy project, identifying model literacy programs and developing and testing new programs, materials, and methods. The Department of Education will work closely with the White House Office of Private Sector Initiatives to enlist more non-government support. An additional $310 million has been requested for college work-study programs to include students in our effort, and I have also asked the department to recruit literacy volunteers on college campuses. Federal employees will also be encouraged to volunteer, and the Department of Education will conduct a series of national meetings and conferences to increase awareness and promote cooperation. Across this great land, let those of us who can read teach those who cannot. Many of the people who can't read and write refused to talk to us. They were afraid of losing their jobs or simply ashamed of themselves. The people we met tonight are now learning to read. They wanted to help, to encourage others to come forward and learn. But today, only a tiny proportion, a mere 3% of all illiterates, are involved in literacy programs. What's worse, there aren't enough tutors to help even those few adults learn. All of us have to become more literate in our increasingly high-tech, computerized society. For illiterates, the inability to read and write is as disabling as a severe physical handicap. What is deeply troubling is not just the plight of individual illiterates, but the fact that each year in America, two million more people are added to the huge reservoir of functional illiterates. Teaching people to read and write is not difficult. What we need is a commitment to do it. 